Okay. Okay, so uh, welcome everyone to join today's AI seminar at ISI. Let's welcome Professor David Paul, who is a professor of computer science at the University of uh, British Columbia. So he's known for his work for um, combining logic and probability, probabilistic inference, relational probabilistic models, statistical relational AI, and semantic science. Uh, Professor Poo uh, authored multiple AI textbooks. He's a former chair of the Association for UAI, the winner of the Kayak 2013 Lifetime Achievement Award, and is a fellow of uh, AAA and Kayak. Let's welcome Professor Poo to talk about probabilistic reasoning about plants, animals, objects, and people. All right. Can you hear me? All right. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So thanks for inviting me. Um, so this, the title comes from this quote from Steven Pinker, the mind is a neural computer fitted by natural selection with combinatorial algorithms for causal and probabilistic reasoning about plants, animals, objects, and people. And so that's what I'm gonna talk about. That's where the first part of the title comes on is probabilistic reasoning about plants, animals, objects, and people. And it's really trying to say, you know, this is what we just want to think about doing. The second part of this talk is about there was a story of romance and disappointment. So what happens is that in this field is that there's people seem to jump on bandwagons and everyone tells you this is the right answer to it. And eventually they get disappointed and other people come along. So what I'm going to do here is I'm gonna tell you why, basically I'm gonna tell you how all of these things work and why they don't really work as, as promised. Okay, so that's my goal here is to um, be equally, um, constructive and, and criticize about everyone because I think there are so many still open problems. A lot of this is trying to get um, particularly, um, you know, new students thinking about, you know, there are actually lots of open problems in this area because often people sort of say the problem is solved, but actually think we're far from being solved. All right, oops, let's go here. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about, first of all, what are relational probabilistic models and what's relational learning? I'm just going to talk about relational models and knowledge graphs. So artificial intelligence studies what an agent should do. And the basic argument for using probability is acting is gambling. So if you're acting in the world, you're gambling, and agents who use probability will lose to those who, you know, who don't use probability will lose to those who do. So a lot of Dutch book arguments. And also there's no prediction is certainty. You should never believe anyone who gives you a definitive prediction. If someone tells you you will not be run over tomorrow, do not believe them. If someone tells you you will be run over tomorrow, do not believe them. Okay, so don't believe people, you know, positive predictions, we want probabilistic predictions that tell us what we're going to do. Um, and I don't know how many people have wondered this before. If you go to machine learning things, you work out the world's made up of features or random variables, but however, if you ask almost everyone else, they'll tell you that the world's made up of things. It's made up of people and trees and birthday parties and airline flights and all sorts and other things, right? It's made up of things. The question is, you know, how do we actually, how do we actually combine these two? How do we think about both of these together? Um, and so these entities and or individuals have properties and their relationships amongst them. Okay, so this is what the world is made of. We want to now combine it with machine learning or features. And so how can we reconcile these two views? Um, and this has been long field with, of you know, relational probabilistic models, we call them. And so we start off with propositional you know, logic and we can add measures over possible worlds and we get probability. We can start up, we can add relations and logical variables and quantification and we get predicate logic and then we're going to think about relational probabilistic models. We're going to do both. We're going to have measures over possible worlds as well as race, relations, logical variables, and quantification. Well, I'm going to sort of talk at a more basic level than that. So let's start off with um, what are relational probabilistic models and relational learning. So introductions to AI and machine learning typically start with learning from relations. So for example, there's all of these topics and all these columns here are sort of categorical or numerical or real valued variables. And we're trying to learn one from another. Here you might want to learn the user action from skips. Okay, but if you actually look at a, at a relational database, you'll find hardly any relations like this. They're mostly 
you know, have meaningless names, student numbers, product IDs, user IDs, movie IDs, and in order to understand what they mean, they're going to be in other relations. So here's an example from the movie lens. Here's the first two tuples for the movie lens 100K, and users are just given arbitrary names. Movies are just arbitrary numbers, and movies are given arbitrary numbers, right? And their rating is actually a, you know, a cardinal value. So there's actually one to five you can do. And a timestamp is this integer. Um, you can do, you know, it's a, we can do, um, it's, a, it's a cardinal value. So you can actually set the unique seconds. And the point here is the names, the 196 and the 186 are just arbitrary names. They can be changed or exchanged with exactly the same meaning. And we're going to exploit that sometimes. So that's what a relational model means. So I'm going to mean that. Is basically lots of the values in here are not just ordinals or cardinals or booleans, but they're actually arbitrary names. So you can't treat this as 186 is less than 196. They're not really integers, they're just names. All right. So now we can have a look at how we might represent things. So first order logic language, like lots of different ways of representing facts. We could write pen seven is red, we could write red pen seven, right? We could then say, well, let's now abstract that more, we could write color pen seven red. The advantage of this is we can ask, what's the color of pen seven where we couldn't before, but everything we could do with red pen seven, we can now do with color pen seven red, but now we can do a bit more with it because we can now ask what's the color of pen seven. So you may think, oh, that's a good idea. We now have, we've now have a better representation because we could do more with it. There's no downsides. So let's do it again. So if we could do it again, you could say, well, this is the property, the property of pen seven color red. Okay, so we could do that again. And it turns out we don't need to do it again because we only never need this single relation. Okay, so this single relation can be implicit and it's called, we end up with triples. So pen seven color is red. Um, turns out that triples are universal representations of relations. So all relations can be represented in terms of triples. If you have a table, you can think of this as the row, the column is the property and this value in here. And it's just the triple, the row RI, PJ and VIJ. Now R of I is either a primary key. So it's either primary key, there's a unique thing. So in the previous examples, the primary key might be just the, the product ID or something like that. Or it's a reified entity. Sometimes it might be just a relation and we reify it. Now reifying is actually just a normal English word. You can look it up in your dictionary and you'll find that it, it means make into it an entity thing. And so there's lots of examples of reified entities. We'll see a booking. So you can have a booking and it might be a, 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 a tart, it might be a, um, a person who booked it, the room booked, you know, um, you know how long it goes for, um, you know, where it's going, you know, location, all sorts of other properties. You know, a marriage might have, there's another entity, you know, has a person, it has the people who are being married, it might have the celebrant, the date, um, and all sorts of things. There's all of these things to reified entities. And so the way we're going to make them into triples is to, um, is to reify them. Now notice there's a chat that I not read, I can't read that, I'm not reading the chat. So please ask out loud if you have something, question. Okay. All right. So this is the only relation you need, this entity property value. They're called triples, semantic networks, entity relation models, knowledge graphs. Okay, so there's just triples. So we're going to see this as one thing to do. Um, we'll find out that it's a bit problematic for learning, but we'll see that in a minute. All right. Now, often people build these knowledge graphs by projecting onto pairs. So here's an example. Air Canada flies from New York to Vancouver and Air Canada flies from Vancouver to Los Angeles. These are all true statements. So the, what people might do, you might be in, thinking about, well, what you want to do is Air Canada flies from New York and Air Canada flies to Los Angeles, but you've lost information here because Air Canada does not fly from, from New York to Los Angeles. Okay, so what you instead do is you make up something like a flight number and a flight number has a source and a destination. Okay, so if you just project it down to triples, in this naive way, you find it loses information. Okay. Um, I also can't read the Q&A, so someone has to talk to me if they want to. Yes, we will something. let you know. Okay, thank you. All right, so let's look at some of these things. So FB15K is a knowledge base commonly used in research papers. And here's two triples 
from this um, knowledge base. So it comes from, it's, a, it's abstracted from free base. And Jade North um, plays position defender. So this is how you'd write, but actually what happens is that this first one's actually a meaningless number that actually you have to look up their name. So we did that, so it's actually slightly readable. This is the actual relation that's used in, um, in FB15K and Defender Association Football. Again, we looked at, had to look up what the debt, we um, did this integrate. Um, and Derby Counter, County has position Defender. Um, but of course, what actually happened was that Freebase did, um, was, um, was actually not a triple store, it was actually a full relations so and that people who did this built it and they just projected it onto these triple, onto these triples in a naive way. And we'll understand why in a minute. Okay, so here's one, and this is actually a very strange one because Derby County has position, as a football club has position defender. And of course it's a very strange triple because all football clubs have position defender. Um, but this is actually a test case in FB 15K. And it's also a test case in all of the um, subsequent ones that are built on FB 15K as far as I know. Um, okay. Um, so I'm gonna tell people they should look at a knowledge graph before you use it. Um, you know, some of these are actually very straight, have very strange things in. All right. <clears throat> the other thing that people tend to do is that entities, they think of entities are like words. So in representing words as vectors, you know, interesting relations are learned. So here's a classic one from, the, um, from an early paper on natural language understanding and embedding models. King minus man plus woman is queen and it automatically found this. Okay. So one might be tempted to write, um, the Brussels is Belgium plus capital of and Washington DC is the USA plus capital of. Okay. So that seems a reasonable thing to do. But because these are vectors, this entails the USA is Belgium minus Brussels plus Washington DC. And if you know anything about Belgium and Brussels and Washington DC, you'll realize that it actually tells you, if you know everything about Belgium, everything about Brussels and everything about Washington DC, it actually tells you very little about the USA. It tells you a little bit about Washington DC. It might tell you other things. Um, there are lots of people who are working on this. Um, you know, the trouble is that words have simple meanings but almost all entities are multifaceted and complex. So what we'd really like to do is there's only a very small aspect of the USA that is described by this formula. Um, so you could actually do things. So there are lots of people who try to fix up the, um, the vector representation, for example, and they're really just trying to project onto these much smaller ones. But I'm not gonna talk very much about that either. All right, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the learning knowledge graphs. Here's an aside, um, which is one of the things that everyone should know, um, but often people don't know, and they're often, it's sort of basic knowledge. I thought I'd, I'd like to put it in because I've talked to students and a lot of them don't know this. Um, so the probability of H hypothesis given the evidence, the probability of H and E divided by the probability evidence, which can draw by like, which can be done like this. And we can divide the top and the bottom by this, um, by the probability of H and E, and we could write this as one, we could take E's and logs um, and you end up with it's one plus E to the log. So what happens is this is the sigmoid of the log odds. Um, so if the odds is a product, we end up with the sigmoid of a sum, which gives us logistic regression. So what happens now is that, is that in, to learn a probability, if you see sigmoid, it means Boolean function and you're doing probability. Okay, so that's what I'm getting here. So I'm gonna put sigmoid sometimes in here without really explaining it. And you wanna say, that's how you translate a sum into a probability. There's a sigmoid, the discrete features, features you do a soft max. Um, but often if you wanna do linear regression, you'd leave it as this. So I'm gonna add in sigmoid sometimes when I'm going to give this examples, and it really means probability. Okay, so sigmoid translates into probability. Um, all right. So to learn a binary relation, um, like likes person movie in pseudo Python, you'd like, you might do this. So you might do this. So this is, um, I'm gonna write it in pseudo Python. Um, so this is the sigmoids because of our probability. And then this is a one that we're summing over all of the features. So E zero of P is a vector and F is a value in it. 
right? This is called a matrix factorization model. Um, where this embedding here is a vector of feature values and there's an embedding for each person in each movie. And I wrote it in this very strange way, right? So if there's a standard notation for matrices, um, and I didn't use that. I used this very strange notation. So why did I do that? Well, the reason I did that is because to me, if you want to now predict a triple, well, the obvious generalization of this is that you multiply three things, right? So you multiply three things together. So you have sigmoid, you're gonna sum over F, you just have H, R and T, and we have these, there's a, a head embedding and a tail embedding, okay? And we multiply three things, um, okay? So this seems to me to be the obvious generalization of this. There's lots of people who don't think this is obvious. Um, and if you sort of train to think in terms of matrices, this is not at all obvious. But it seems to me of jumping from two multiplications to three is not a big deal. It's just the natural thing to do. Um, this is called the polyadic decomposition model. Um, it's you know, basically from 1927. And uh, the paper is actually interesting to read, the polyadic decomposition paper, because um, they're quite familiar there. There's no sort of bias towards matrices over other tensors. So this is a tensor product model. Um, and basically, there's two vector embeddings for each entity and one for each relation in this model. Okay, so this is the, the polyadic decomposition. All right. Unfortunately, it doesn't work very well. So here's an example of two triples. So person one, two, three likes movie 53. And movie 53 is directed by person five, three, four. And you might want to learn the fact that person one, two, three likes movies that are directed by person five, three, four. Now, unfortunately, the previous model cannot do that. And the reason why is lower, it requires two entities per embedding. So M53 has a two embeddings, has a head embedding and a tail embedding. But the head and tail embeddings don't interact at all with each other. Okay, so you actually can't learn this. You can't learn that person one, two, three likes movies directed by P534. So by itself, it doesn't work very well. So it seemed promising, it doesn't work very well. So what we could do is we could do other ones. So here's distvolt, which shares the same embeddings for the head and the tail. Okay. Um, the problem with that is it can only represent symmetric relations. Um, we could do complex, is like distvolt, but the embeddings are complex numbers and the tail is the conjugate of the uh, head embeddings. Um, so the it's like this, but the where they are complex numbers, and there's the we have, and there's a particular way we're twisting this around. Another model that's even that's simple is a simple embedding is we have an embedding for r to the minus one. So we also embed, we also learn the inverse relation, and we learn to predict both the head is related to t and the tail is related by the inverse to the head. This is actually like it's actually very similar to complex. It's just that it's actually internally, it's simpler because the real value is, is just sort of a couple of multiplications instead of, I believe, four for complex inside it. Um, but it's also nice because, all right. Another one that actually is simpler than that is simple plus, it's simple with non-negative entity embeddings. Okay, it can represent arbitrary relations. Um, Point by is less than or equal to corresponds to implications. So it can do implication between relations is just less than or equal to. And the reason why I'm presenting this now is I can explain what it learns. Okay, so I can explain exactly what's going on and why this is working and what is the limitation of it. All right. Um, if there are any questions, please, um, please yell. All right. Oops, I've lost my screen. All right. All right. So this is the polyadic decomposition, the plus minus of it. So for us now, this is the product. So this is the sigmoid of these three products. And I'm going to assume that E0 and E2 are greater than or equal to zero. I'm also going to assume that all embedding values are bounded. So if you look at this product, what you want to do is basically we want to find the non-zero values. So the non-zero values are the ones that actually matter. So all the zero values, it doesn't really matter, right? So they're just sort of 
wash out in the system. So wash out in there. So you want those which are which are non-zero as ones we're going to think about. So the ones that are zero, so this one's approximately zero if all three of them are zero. So if any of them are zero, approximately zero, then this whole thing gets to be zero because it's bounded. So if any one of these is zero, it's going to be bounded. Okay. Um, so that's what's going on here is that we end up having this one here is if any of these are zero, well, then it's, you know, then the whole thing is approximately zero. So let's look at the cases about where it's positive, where it's way, bound, way above zero. So it's much bigger than zero. It actually makes a difference in the sigmoid. So if it's zero, it doesn't make much difference. If it's, so the ones where it matters, those three, well, all three of them are much bigger than zero. So all three of them are much bigger than zero in order to make this one much bigger than zero. So now this lets us understand what's going on here. So what happens is that this feature I, so let's look at this particular feature I, forms two soft clusterings of entities. Those entities which E0 of EI is high, so there's those ones which the head embedding is high, so there's all of those. So there's all, they're clustering those individuals which the head embedding is high. And this one here is the clustering of all those individuals which the tail embedding is high. And what happens is that the entities in this first cluster are related to the entities in the second cluster for any of the relations in which E of Ri is high. So what we're doing is thinking about, they're just clustering um, in the head and the tail. What we're doing is we're clustering in the head and the tail. All of these are related to this if you select this. And, and the relations go along and select which of these embeddings they're going to include. Okay, so it's the soft clustering of entities is what's going on here. And it's going to talk about um, now which one, you know, which one is, you know, which groupings are we going, which entities are related to each other. Um, and the negative values of this E of uh, this relation embedding provide exceptions in here. So these, so we have these general, the positive ones provide positive information, and then you can have exceptions by the negative values. Okay. Um, if anyone has any questions, please ask. Okay. All right. So let's look at what might be wrong with this. Suppose we want to create a model of who is friends with whom, right? So who's friends with who? Sort of a, a classic example. So the options are, you could learn general knowledge, you could learn transitivity, how males and female friendship works, how location affects friendship, things like that. Or you could learn very specific knowledge about who is friends with who, which particular group of people are generally friends with each other. Okay, so this group of people has done this. And it turns out that the models that we've seen before do the second one, right? That's what we're actually doing. We're actually learning clusters of entities that are generally friends. We're not learning generalized knowledge, okay? Um, so this specific knowledge tends to be more accurate on that population, but doesn't generalize to different populations. So if you're Facebook, you probably want to learn clusters of people. If you want to then transfer it, if you want to learn some general knowledge and transfer it to the other ones, you don't want to use those models that we've seen before. OK, um, which is better depends on how the goal and successes is measured. So when we have a test case, which is just a subset of the training case, then the second one, we're biasing our, our evaluation to learn the second one. OK, so you really want to worry about that. Um, ideally, we'd like to do both. We'd like to learn about specific entities and learn general knowledge. OK. Um, <clears throat> Now, one problem that arises, and this is probably the biggest problem that arises, the biggest um, problem with um, current relational learning is how do we evaluate a prediction? So what we normally do is we normally end up with, given the triples of Jade North, place, position, defender, we'd like to say Jade North, place, position, what? And who, place, position, defender? And Derby County Football Club has position, what? And you know, what has position defender? So who has position defender? And what we're trying to do then we build a ranking of all of these things. Okay, so then we list all, we can answer that question by listing all of these values. Okay, so the common measures are measured based on ranking, such as the mean reciprocal rank or the hit at one or the hit at 10. Um, and by the way, if you do that, you can actually, so what we often, what we typically do is we optimize assuming there's a sigmoid or a softmax because that lets us actually do the training because we actually, we typically train to you know, 
minimize entropy or, or you know, to, to um, log likelihood, we trained at time, we trade on log likelihood on the sigmoid, but then we ignore it when we're evaluating it um, because we're only cared about the ranking, okay? The problem is, there's a few problems with ranking. It's not good for answers for which there's no answer or many answers. You know, who is the Pope married to? Well, the answer is no one, but that's actually never a question that can ever arise in these things, in this system. So we can't, it's a sort of question that just never arises in any test set because the Pope's not married to anyone. It's just, we're not even optimizing for this. We can't even sort of ask the question in this. Um, even more challenging is, you know, who has streamed Drake's music, right? Drake has, you know, what was it? 60 billion streams on um, Spotify. Um, so there's lots of people who streamed Jake Drake's music. And now if you say, oh, I'm thinking of someone who streamed Jake's, Drake's music, who is it? Well, you could go through all six all billion people or whoever many it is. Um, and it's pretty unlikely that you're gonna hit the person who they're guessing. So the biggest problem is that an omniscient agent does very poorly on ranking scores, right? So you could probably, an omniscient agent can probably answer the question, what does Jade, what position does Jade North play? Right, that's actually a, a reasonable question on the, uh, that an omniscient agent, so an all-knowing agent, an agent who knows everything. But if you ask who plays position defender, then if they know every person who plays position defender perfectly, they go extremely badly on, on, on ranking scores, but it's very unlikely they're gonna stumble across Jade North, right? Because Jade North is, uh, you know, um, is probably not the most well-known person. Um, Derby County Football Club has position. Well, you could probably guess that it has position defender because that's probably the most common position. Um, so, and if you asked who has position defender, it's probably very low on your, uh, very low on the count about where Derby County comes in here. But these are both questions that are um, that arise in the in the test case of free base 15k. So what we nearly need is a good evaluation scheme. Log likelihood seems reasonable, but it requires the knowledge of negations. So the reason we do ranking is because we don't have negative information, right? And the typical thing you do is you end up saying for each positive example we do, we vary it a little bit and add those as negative, right? And then we do ranking because it's the only thing we can measure. You know, it's it's a bit like the a drunk looking for their keys when they look under the light because that's the only place they can see. It seems the only measure we do. You know, it's really, I think ranking is, we really need a better way to do this. Um, all right. So now let's look at what happens when we want to go beyond triples. So what we could do is to convert them to triples by reify. Okay. Now the trouble with this, this actually doesn't work, is the reified entities have very few data points. So the number of data points, if you have a, um, if you have a booking, it might be the per just have a few arguments. It might have the person who booked it, you know, the room and the location and the time, right? So it might only have very few things. So the number of arguments for the relationship is the is the number of data points about the reified entity. Okay. So when we try to learn these things, um, there's actually none of these, and in fact, a lot of these relational learning data sets actually throw out all entities for which very which there's very few little data, right? But that means it's throwing out every single and every single um, reified entity. So that's why people don't reify is because all the data, none of the algorithms work for it. You really should reify, but none of the algorithms work for reify. So, so people ignore it because they don't know how to do it. But you really should reify and you really have to handle this case about very few data points. So what you could do is you could de design embedding based models that work directly with original relations. And you could, the other way to do it is to allow them to be inferred from other relations. Okay, so here's one way of viewing. So here's, so let's look at some of the work we did recently. I'm not actually going to dwell on this because I want to talk about something else after this. So disk bulk complex simple simple plus we can view it as this one here. There's there's a head embedding. So whatever the head argument is, this is the embedding through this row here. There's the relation embedding, and there's the tail embedding. Um, and lots of these models fit in with this pattern. It turns out that it's enough to just consider windows of size two in here. Um, so for complex, this might be the real and the imaginary part. For simple and simple plus, this might be the 
the part that does the forward relation and the inverse relations. So we're going to pair them up. Okay. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to pair them up and do this. So we're going to some function in here. We're going to add in, going to do some additions and multiplications in here, and then we're going to sum them up. We're going to treat them as independently, the windows. If you don't, if you try to treat this as one big, um, as just a big neural network stuck on this whole, on this whole vector, you end up finding that there are way too many parameters and way too little data. Um, typically there are some relations, there are very few data sets and you can way overfit things. Um, so, so typically what we do is we do it in separate ind independent windows for the reason we did before. So what you could do, the obvious now way to extend this is to have, is to represent R of A1, A2 and A3 is to have, you have the embedding for A1, the embedding for A2 and the embedding for A3. And then the relation, well, maybe it's a bit more than one row. Okay, so this is actually a pattern that, you know, that seems to work well. Um, you know, the window size of these varies and each window is independent because otherwise there are just too many parameters, we don't have enough data. Um, and in here, what we're trying to do is we're trying to get given each window, we then build a, some model about how the prediction from this window, right? Just like we did for simple and relations. And this general thing seems to work well, okay? Um, but there are lots of variations you do and the current one that works best this, um, this month is probably not the same one that will work, you know, the same one that we're best in December when Durex comes out, there's probably going to be a better one. And then there's probably going to be a better one for the conference after that. But this pattern actually works well. Okay. I actually wanted to talk about something different. Um, so one of the things that's a problem with those things is the embedding gives a measure of similarity. And there's also this idea of identity. So let's think about this. Consider a flight with a stopover. There's a flight from A to B, if there exists the flight from A to C, and if there exists the flight from C to B, right? And now we have multiple airports and each have a similarity, but two very, very similar airports. They might in fact have the same embedding. Right, they might be so similar, they might, might be a carbon copy one, right? And you might fly to one, one airport and you say, and you have you expect to get on the plane to the next one. And they say, oh no, this leaves from a very, very similar airport, almost the same, except it's a thousand miles away. And the problem is that we don't have this notion of identity. So identity has to be important. So the airport, the second flight must be the same, not just similar as the airport from the first flight. There's a problem of identity is actually an important problem to worry about. Um, most people ignore it, but it's a really important problem, but some people don't. Um, here's a question for you. In the room was Sam's mother, Chris's football coach and a brilliant mathematician. How many people were in the room? Can someone tell me? I'm not sure. Um, all right. I can't hear anyone. Uh, 20, so how many? 23 in the room currently. No, there's at least one. So they might all be the same person, right? So there's not three. The answer is at least one, okay? So Sam's mother, Chris's football coach, and a brilliant mathematician could all be the same person, right? So we have to, so if you see descriptions of things, you have to worry about identity is important because there might only be one person in there, okay? It's also specified that there was no one else. There's between one and three people. Um, as an aside, unfortunately, knowledge graphs aren't able to state there are no more people. Um, the current vocabulary that we have isn't able to actually state there are no more people. Um, it's sort of, you know, we know that some things are pretty complete, um, but we, there's actually no way of stating it. Um, all right, similar is not the same as identity. So similar and identity are not the same thing. So here are two chairs from our living room. I just took a picture. Um, and they're the same make and color. Um, and they're identical. You couldn't tell them apart. If I showed you one and the other, you couldn't tell them apart. However, they're not the same chair. There's two chairs. So although they're completely similar, they're basically identical. You can't tell them apart. Um, even the wrinkles seem to be very similar. They're not the same chair because there's two chairs. Um, here's two people. Um, it turns out this is the Queen of Canada. I had to find someone who I could find an old picture and a new picture of. So, you know, I believe this is about 80 years apart when she was a little kid and when she's, um, you know, I think she's in her 90s now. 
you didn't learn anything today, at least you should learn the Queen, the Canada has a Queen. Um, all right. So is this, but they're the same person. So identity is actually a, a very tricky problem. Um, here's another example. Is this reference the same paper as this other reference? So people who worry about, um, who do citation matching, worry about the problem of identity. Was there a burglar here last night? Was the burglar the same person as one of the people in the lineup? Um, people are tempted to think about this as a property of an entity. However, it's, you get into trouble because when existence is false, there's no entity. Um, and two entities can't be equal, have the same identity because then there is only one person, right? Um, and lots of the methods, graph neural networks, Markov, Markov logic networks, probabilistic logic programs, assume this is already solved. We know what entities exist and that they're all distinct. So let's look at these graph-based models. <clears throat> so there's a common framework here. So the nodes are entities. So we've already solved this ex ex existential problem and there's what exists and the identity problem. They're already disambiguated. We know that we're assuming someone else has solved that problem. And there's hyper edges or edges between entities that are related. And the function depends on the types of the entities. So whether one person likes another depends on the properties of their entity. The entity is not the identity. Um, there's actually, you can't learn them if you actually worry about identity. You have to worry about the properties. Um, right, Markov logic networks and probabilistic logic programs to find factors with learnable parameters. And all of these properties include the latent properties of a probabilistic interpretation. Okay. Um, graph neural networks defined how properties of a node depend on its neighbors using some differentiable function. So we can view graph neural networks in a very similar way. Um, and the main difference is in Markov logic networks, probabilistic logic programs, latent variables have a probabilistic interpretation. So all these latent variables, you know, we're actually trying to interpret that and inference becomes hard and, and it becomes difficult. But then in graph neural networks, you say, we don't care about this probabilistic interpretation, except at the end, because we typically um, make a probability assumption at the end. Um, but we're going to just maximize predictive performance. And of course, if you have more constraints, then you're going to go worse. So graph neural networks are of course better. So in fact, a lot of the reasons why neural networks are better is because they give up assuming anything. They're just gonna to try to optimize for predictive power. They're gonna give up interpretability, but of course that gets into trouble because you can't explain what's going on. Um, okay, so let's talk about one problem that arises with all of these things. And that's the problem of aggregation. So how the neighbors affect the prediction of a node. You could, what you typically do is you typically build a model of how the neighbors of different type affect a node. So we're gonna talk about, you know, you know, how, you know, all sorts of different types of things affect a node. Um, and for neighbors of the same type, we need to, however, for neighbors of the same type, we need to combine them. So let's give an example, it's called aggregation. So here's an example. What we'd like to do is we'd like to, so, Familiar example from um, sort of, for example, for example, movie lens of predicting from you know just a, a rating data set. There's rating of person on movie. And what we'd like to do is we'd like to predict either the gender or the age. The gender is something that, for example, is provided in in um, in movie lens, and so is age is provided. So we have to test these things. Okay. Now the previous methods don't work for this example. You can't predict gender or age from rating. Basically, because they project onto some lower dimensional representation, but there isn't one for gender or age. Okay, so if you actually try to run any of the previous ones I've seen before, it doesn't work. Um, so well, what happens if you actually try it is that one of the embeddings for each person just memorizes the age. You don't generalize, you don't actually get to predict it. So you have to do actually do something different than what we did before. Um, and it requires something called aggregation. Now, some models provide built-in aggregation. So some models have implicit aggregation. And some you can use whatever aggregation you want. You basically say, oh, you can do whatever you want, you know, whatever you like, but of course you don't know what you like. All right. So graph neural networks um, require an explicit aggregator. It's typically some average or max. There's actually a nicely explained in this paper by Sue et al, um, how powerful are graph neural networks. Okay. Um, so for average and max, 
what happens is that more data for a particular individual doesn't give better predictions. So if you have a one movie rated versus a thousand rated, you'd expect to give, if you have a thousand movies rated, you'd expect to give a much better prediction, you have much more data about. Them. But in fact, the exact opposite happens. You tend to very overfit to that one movie. So normally if you have just one data point, you want to regularize it so you don't make very much prediction, but that's not what happens with average or max, right? So you can think of this for each movie as a data set for that person and you do exactly the wrong thing. So it overfits the single examples. If you have a thousand, it sort of, it, it doesn't actually use the thousand information, right? It doesn't actually get better predictions from more data on them. So there's sort of, it's very strange when it does that. Um, for some, we're gonna see what happens then. So we're actually going to talk about something else then. Um, so this is the question about how is the relation affected by other relations, so-called aggregation. Um, and there's a few things that we're going to look at. So we're actually, so we're going to look at what happens with um, these probabilistic relational models. It's weighted formula. Um, so you can actually do weighted formula. That's the example I'm going to give now. The sort of Markov logic networks is the undirected version. The directed analog is the relational logistic regression. Um, for probabilistic logic program doing um, aggregation by existential quantification, which is noisy or, they do noisy or aggregation. These one do weighted formula. Um, by the way, Markov logic networks and relational logistic regression is, are identical when you observed everything except one. It's how they marginalize is different. Um, I should also mention one of my favorite models is relational dependency networks. Um, these are directed models that introduce a Markov chain. You know, they're underappreciated, I think. I just thought that as an aside. Um, all right. So if actually, what we're going to do is we're going to look at this problem about how population size affects it. So how does this population size affect it? Because it turns out this is what's going to be very strange in all of these models. So none of these models actually work, I'm going to claim. So if we just look at this very simple model, so it turns out we have this weighted formula for Qs and Rs, and don't worry about the details of this at all. All we want to do is the probability of Q depending on the population about how many Rs there are, right? So that's what this is. N is the number of Rs. And it's a sigmoid of something with N in it. Um, for relational logistic regression, you do this other sigmoid and you have to do some counting over them. Um, and for the mean, for you, the other way to do it is just to pretend you have, you know, N of them have, have alpha one and one minus N have alpha two. And if you plot this, and here's the plotting of the population on the left and the Q on the right, um, you'll end up finding they have this old nice, <clears throat> this nice format. Um, so here's the formula I did before. I don't expect you to do it. It just says you can actually predict. These have predictive values for how the population affects, so that how the population affects N is fixed by the model. Okay, we typically don't actually learn this. Um, for Markov logic networks and relational logistic regression, I believe it also holds for graph neural networks with sum as an aggregator, but I we wrote this paper before we um, it exists. Um, and we're assuming a prior distribution over properties of unobserved entities. So if we have a prior distribution over the unobserved entities, because um, we're going to take things to the limit, and so we need to work out where the limit is. A feature of an identity that has an aggregation with a set of entities, like we did before, like um, movie like you know age and movie as a number of entities goes to infinity with no observations it either has probability zero or one right so basically each little epsilon if it's, it's epsilon is pi if you keep adding epsilons if you add positive things right up with a probability of one if you keep if epsilon is you keep every time you do it you subtract it gets lower then you have it up with zero or it's not affected by the population so in here, you get these very strange models um, where it's unaffected by the population. Um, in which case, it's either numerically unstable or it's equivalent to noisy or. Um, and the number of observations, if you actually observe things, so actually observe things that even the, um, the, the, the noisy or models all go to either zero or one. So if you actually, if you have a noisy or, it actually, you can actually ignore non-observed things, but if you actually observe things, it still goes to zero or one. So it's actually very strange, this thing. Um, so if you actually plot it for real data, you can do this. So here's the number of movies rated for 
movie lens 100K, and um, this is the probability of the ages between this and this, you'll find that it doesn't actually fit any of those curves. It actually doesn't fit any of those curves which you're doing it. Um, and so it's sort of um, interesting as to try to actually extrapolate with this. Um, as, oh, I'm running out of time. All right, so sometimes you can get polynomials and polynomials are weird, I'll skip that. Um, I don't want to have time to do that, all right. Um, sorry. Um, if Markov logic networks are actually interesting because they let you do more interesting things than linear functions. So before we could sort of do linear functions, it actually lets you do R polynomials. So when you have the R of twice in here, it does, it actually squares it. Um, so if all of these R's are observed, then the probability of Q given some observation is the, um, is this formula where this is the number of true individuals for R. So it's a polynomial. So we can actually get the sigmoid of a polynomial. So it's actually, we can actually do more than just the linear function of summing things, we can actually do polynomials. Our polynomials are very strange, very strange in here, what we can do here. So let's look at these sigmoids of polynomial of degree two. Here are two sigmoids. And what's important to notice here is this has a negative before the n squared. And so this has the positive before the n squared. And both of these actually look very similar. They both go from about one at n is 10 to about zero at n is 30. So they're just curved down between 10 and 30. And but notice that because of this formulation here, one is concave and one is convex. So if you plot this, you'll end up finding this. You'll end up finding they're almost identical for small populations, but this one, the n squared, if it goes down, it has to come up. So it comes up at some arbitrary point in the future. So it actually turns out the polynomial extrapolation is, um, is you've got to be wary of it a lot. It seems tempting to use it because you can fit our data set really well. It works very badly for extrapolation. Um, and what happens is that this is actually a very extremely simple one dimensional example, but when you have you know, thousands of dimensions, then in different directions, then you actually follow this polynomial. You get all sorts of very strange things what happens in extrapolation. So you have to be careful about doing this. So th these, none of these actually work for as a way to extrapolate. So I'm going to claim that we still don't know how to do aggregation. Um, okay, I just want to do an aside here. Um, one of the things that we also want to think about is this idea is before we know anything about the identity entities, they're indistinguishable. And so they should be treated identically. So that's the idea of exchangeability. The names can be exchanged and the model doesn't change. So the names are just nothing. So it turns out this is something we can exploit. Um, so in Bayesianism, we probably depend on what's known. So this is conditioning. So entities about which we have the same information must have the same probability. Okay, so if you have the same information, must have the same. But that's actually something we can now exploit. So that's exploit. So that's exploiting a symmetry that can be exploited in listed inference. Um, and that's a whole other talk. We have a, um, a new book coming out this month or next month in MIT Press called Introduction to Listed Inference um, <coughs> by Guy, Christian, and Sriram and I um, coming out. <coughs> we also see Guy's um, Computers and Thought Award lecture, which is a nice introduction. All right, so let's do a conclusion here. Um, one of the other problems I didn't talk to you about, I think a lot of the problems we're doing now is um, we keep trying to have standardized data sets and we avoid, we're overfitting onto these standardized data sets. I think that's a real problem. Um, you know, this FB15K, for example, I believe we're way overfitting to it. We need to have general theories that make sense and we can do things. Um, we need better evaluation metrics. Um, I'm going to claim that what we want to do is we want an, um, one that an omniscient agent should do well on. So if you know everything, you can actually do well on this evaluation metric. You know, log likelihoods, predicting probabilities, log likelihood seems like a good one. The, an omniscient agent who knows everything will do very well on it. Ranking is, you know, if you know everything, you still do very badly on ranking and you would tend to overfit to the ranking. Um, if you actually try to evaluate on ranking and it's something that you probably, you know, you're probably just not really learning the truth. You're just sort of learning what's the most popular thing that people would say. You know, if you just ask Justin Bieber to all these questions, you probably get a, you probably go reasonably well where, um, all right. 
one of the reasons why we don't use um, why we don't use log like is we need negative evidence prior you know we typically what happens is data given this state this example we just had a whole lot of negative examples related to it and some of them might be true but it doesn't really matter it's just noise um, and we can handle noise um, we need to develop prior knowledge so wiki data um, this is a good example that has almost complete information about celebrities. I think it has 70,000 triples about Justin Bieber, for example. Um, so it probably knows everything there is about Justin Bieber. Um, so it actually does that. Um, so it actually might be able to use meta information, um, prior knowledge, and it's different prior knowledge than a Bayesian prior, saying it, this information is pretty complete about Justin Bieber or about some parts of Justin Bieber's life. Um, uh, but the other thing you have to worry about is people in Wikidata is not a random sample. Um, so if you might want to predict how people in Wikidata work, then you probably might not generalize well to the general population. Um, so you have to, we have to worry about that. So we need ways of somehow adding prior knowledge into this, even just telling it what we mean. Um, predicting properties of entities and relationships is sort of currently different problems. Um, you know, methods that work for one often don't work for others, but authors are often not really explicit about what they do, the limitations of these things. They test on these data sets and you have to know a lot about these particular problems to know what particular problem they're solving. Um, so, you know, all these embedding based models don't really work for predicting um, age from, mo from movie lens, which is a very simple problem. Um, we need much better models of aggregation. I don't think any of them work now. Um, I think they're all, you know, everyone just assumes that it works, um, and I, I don't think any of them work. Um, we need to take existence and identity of entities more seriously in general learning models, so people actually work on existence and identity uncertainty. Um, you know, the classic example is citation matching. Um, um, and we want to interact with time. Ontologies, I think, are really important for this, and interactions with causality. So. There's still lots of work to do. And part of this talk was to try to tell you know, younger researchers, you know, there's actually lots of problems that come and work in this area. All right, um, I will finish here. So if anyone has any questions, I'll try and work out how to actually. All right, thank you all. I'll leave this quote up here at the end. Thanks, David, for the very rich talk. And uh, the audience, if you have questions, please uh, feel free to type in the chat. Actually, I want to start with a question about myself. So I actually worked on relational embeddings for some time. Over there, uh, I have a question which is about a prediction with abstention. So let's say, okay, we, we, we have a knowledge graph and we train a relational embedding and whatever, then whatever query we give to this model, it will always give an answer, right? But it's, it's very likely that some queries, they are not answerable. So uh, David, do you think there's a good way that uh, in the inference time, which uh, we let the model predict that for some queries, it should predict abstention instead of any answers? Yeah, that's actually a good question. Um, you know, who's the Pope married to? The answer should be no one. Um, that's actually really hard when you're a Bayesian, you basically compare hypotheses that you have Right, so you actually want to extend the hypothesis space and to include some, something else is going on. Like there might be nothing that they're doing, or there might be something, um, or so the, the hypothesis might be no one. There's no answer to it. You know, they're not Justin Bieber is not married to this person. Um, but whereas you, um, right, so the you might want to answer nothing. Um, but typically with Bayesians, you know, you just have a fixed hypothesis space and you answer, you just compare those. And typically how to extend a hypothesis space is, is difficult um, in general, even for this. Um, so there's obvious hypothesis, like it's just noise, right? For the null hypothesis. That's obviously another hypothesis you should also throw in there, right? But well, it's, there's nothing going on. Um, yeah, but that's actually a really tricky problem. Um, it's, it happens in relation, it happens in all sorts of problems. I mean, in diagnosis, it's particularly problematic because you, someone comes with symptoms, you want to say, well, actually, you don't have any of these diseases, they have something else. Um, so actually, you're right. It's sort of, it's not really a, it's a problem that arises um, 
whatever you're doing, probabilistic inference is things outside of your space of possibilities gets into trouble. Um, I don't think there's anything in here that's particular, except for the case you might want to say none, but then the data actually doesn't tell you that there are no more. So I think we just, even a slight extension to a knowledge graph to saying, and there are no more, right? Justin Bieber has released these albums and there are no more, right? Would actually be go a long way in order to, um, in order to, um, to let us build, to let us learn these negative things to be able to predict no. Yeah, I do agree that actually, I think the evaluation nowadays, people focus on those, uh, you know, widely used benchmarks, but over there, there's actually no evaluation about, you know, predicting none. Although yes. in some relevant areas, I would say, for example, in question answering, there's a two, well, 2.0 over there, people are trying to solve this problem nowadays for, you know, detecting unanswerable questions. And uh, we recently had a paper about that's actually an ontology alignment work, but over there we propose this problem of you have two ontologies, but over there, two sets of concepts that are kind of there are parts of them which are disjoint. So there's no exact it, that's not exact one to one alignment. Some parts on the left, some parts on the right, they are not matchable to the uh, uh, to, to 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 the to the other set. I think that's a problem which has been overlooked for some time in this area, uh, in, uh, that's, that's in my opinion, but this is actually a quite realistic problem. Yeah, I agree. It's sort of, it's, uh, there's lots of open problems. I mean, I think what happens is that people tend to write papers and then um, claim they've solved all the problems. But when you, one of the reasons that I thought that I would do the talk that I did today was to tell people, there are really lots of open problems we don't know how to solve. Um, so get involved in it. It's an exciting area. There are lots of interesting open problems still um, because I know that often people think that, they're, that the problems are, you know, we've solved all the problems, that there are no real really hard problems we're solving. Yeah. Also, I think, how, how do we represent uncertainty in the representation learning in learning space is also a very interesting problem because, you know, knowledge, relation, facts, they come with different confidence, but you know, previously yeah. all the models like this model or those stuff, they just treat everything as the same confidence. Yes, well, we really need to worry about the provenance of the data, where the data comes from, right? And then you want to learn the reliability of people, the, um, you know, how reliable was this person? How reliable is this source? And you actually want to reason about the sources of this knowledge. Because um, I know in, scientific data sets is very common to actually have relational data sets that come with rich meta knowledge about the um about the provenance of the data you know who recorded it what instrument was used to record it and also where it was done um, you know, um and all sorts of things like that about how you chose that to put that piece of knowledge in right was it just randomly or was it because um because enough of what happens you get data is often very biased. Um, I do lots of work in geology um, and there we actually have you know, people tell us things because they're strange. It's all a knowledge base, it's not the normal things, which is very dull and boring. They tell you about the interesting things which are not random samples. Um, and also work in, do some med work in medicine. And again, you get this very biased sampling of people who come into doctor's office. They go into doctor's office because they have symptoms. Um, of course, in medicine, you actually want to um, you want to talk treat the people who have comes into doctor's office. They're the people. They're the sample we're interested in. But other things. So data you really have to think about data itself, not just the models of predicting it. Um, yeah. Okay. So I guess we we are about uh, 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 at the right time. And uh, actually, uh, thanks again, Professor Paul, for this very rich talk. And uh, I think a couple of us are going to have some follow-up discussion with you, including myself. I do have a list of questions already, but, but yeah, I really look forward to have more discussions with you on, on this right. relation. Yeah. Yep, thanks for inviting me. Okay, all right. Okay.